global population continues to face many challenging situations daily. Climate change, financial losses, fear, anxiety, sickness, death. It may sometimes seem like this season of gloom will never end and many are losing hope. The future may be daunting, but in the midst of your hopelessness, I can assure you that God, who is the creator of this world, still has the world in the palm of his hands. And for this reason, you can still have ministry that we are now able to impact. We want to welcome you again to the Wednesday night Bible classes uh, for the Stonecrest uh, Church of Christ. Thank you so very much for tuning in each Wednesday night to uh, study with us from uh, the Word of God. We affectionately call this hour uh, at Stonecrest Church, Wednesdays in the Word, uh, where our church gathers around the Word of God, open it up to see what it says in its own historical and literary context, and then apply it to our lives for a living uh, in the uh, the year 2022. 20, uh, 
let me begin by thanking uh, Bishop uh, uh, Anthony Brooks for covering for me the last uh, uh, two weeks. And let me thank you for praying for our Brother Crawford and I uh, as we uh, were on a 10-day study tour uh, of the land of Israel. And it was very meaningful, very educational. Uh, he and I are even now preparing a presentation uh, for you to kind of summarize uh, our trip, uh, its meaning, its significance, its educational uh, value uh, to us, and we've even contemplated uh, of having our own tour uh, in the next year uh, or two. Well, we gather some of you together and then just go over and visit a lot of those historic sites that will just open up uh, the Bible uh, in a very meaningful way uh, to you. So thank you for praying uh, for us. Uh, we want to remind uh, all of the ladies who are uh, viewing our uh, study tonight that uh, each month uh, Stonecrest ladies get together uh, on a Saturday morning uh, and open up the Bible to be encouraged by uh, a speaker, by the fellowship uh, one uh, with another. Uh, we call that a light ministry uh, that meeting will convene this Saturday uh, at 11 a.m. Sonia Anderson, uh, one of the members uh, of our congregation, is going to uh, be the uh, keynote speaker on the, this Saturday. Uh, if you have not made a habit of joining the ladies for that, perhaps you want to start uh, this Saturday. Uh, for the ladies of our congregation, you will get a breeze announcement uh, in the next day or so, uh, if uh, you are not a member of our congregation and you would like to participate uh, in this virtual event, if you just simply write your name uh, in the chat box, your email address, uh, you'll be placed on the mailing list and you'll get the flyer uh, with uh, uh, the passcode and all of that necessary uh, information to join them in their study this Saturday at 11 uh, a.m. We would also ask uh, and cover your prayers for us as we'll be journeying to uh, Newark, New Jersey uh, for the homecoming celebration of one of our pioneer preachers, uh, Dr. Eugene Lawton, uh, who will be funeralized this Saturday uh, in the Newark, uh, New Jersey. On Friday afternoon, I'll be leading uh, the preachers of our nation uh, in a special uh, remembrance uh, uh, service for ministers only. Uh, ministers are coming from across the nation and across the world uh, to celebrate the life and the legacy uh, of Dr. Eugene Lord. Please pray for him and the Newark uh, church. He leaves to mourn his passing, a daughter uh, and two sons, uh, and a whole lot of spiritual sons throughout not only our nation, uh, but our world. Uh, we mourn his passing. We rejoice uh, in the fruit uh, of his life, and he will be remembered with great adulation and great respect for advancing uh, the kingdom of Almighty God. We have members of our congregation uh, who came up under the ministry of uh, Dr. Lawton uh, coming to mind, brother and sister Wright, uh, uh, sister uh, Kelly Brooks, uh, were all impacted uh, by the ministry of uh, uh, Dr. Lawton. And I know that the Wrights uh, will join me uh, in our journey uh, there. So pray for uh, all of us as we uh, go to celebrate the life and the legacy uh, of Dr. Eugene Lawton. And then let me ask that you uh, just uh, place uh, in memory, someone please write it in the chat, uh, May 15th through May 19th uh, will be the dates for our second uh, annual Stonecrest Issachar Conference. We have another tremendous, uh, potent, and powerful lineup 
of speakers and workshops uh, from across uh, the nation. Uh, we have several of our own members who have already uh, presented their recordings of their lectures, uh, of their speeches to the conference, and uh, uh, we'll be uh, sharing more information uh, about that uh, in the weeks to come. But please put in the chat somebody, May uh, 15th through May 19th, uh, go to our website, at stonecrestisacarconference.com. Uh, register, registration is free. It uh, doesn't cost you anything uh, to register, though if you choose to make a donation, uh, we certainly would appreciate that. Uh, donations are going to benefit uh, Southwestern Christian College uh, as well as the I Am Mission uh, Ministry uh, to Haiti uh, that's led by the Southside Church. Uh, in Chicago, Illinois. And we, uh, over the years, have supported uh, this wonderful uh, mission effort to uh, uh, the good people of Haiti. So please go to the website. Please write it in the chat, somebody. StonecrestIsacarConference.com. Uh, register. Uh, we will be so appreciative. You can look at all of the speakers, uh, the workshop presenters, uh, the ladies uh, presenters. Uh, uh, you can read about their bios, all of their subjects uh, are already on the website, and we encourage you uh, to do that. Now, um, a couple of months ago, um, uh, I presented uh, a lecture to our men uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, the lecture came out of a question uh, that was asked uh, in January's uh, men's ministry meeting. Uh, the question was posed by uh, one of our cameramen who's on site today, James Williams, uh, when he asked about uh, the configuration uh, of this book uh, that we call the Bible. Uh, more specifically, uh, he asked in that session, uh, where did the Bible come from? Uh, how was it collected? Uh, how much trust and faith uh, can we place uh, in this document? Are there human hands attached uh, to the document? Um, these 66 books uh, that we have recorded and what we call uh, the canon of scripture. Uh, uh, how were these books selected? Uh, it was those kinds of questions that I heard in a meeting that morning. And so uh, I asked permission uh, of the leader uh, of that ministry, Craig Twaits, uh, who does an outstanding job on a monthly basis uh, with our men. Uh, keeping us engaged, keeping us encouraged, uh, keeping us informed. And I asked him uh, for permission to have a couple of months uh, to be able to answer uh, some of those questions, excellent questions uh, raised by uh, uh, Brother James Williams. Uh, and so I presented uh, the first uh, message and after that message several of the brothers reached out to me and said hey uh, this is information that the church could benefit uh, from would you consider uh, uh, presenting this information uh, to them uh, I so agreed didn't expect to be doing it uh, this soon but uh, some of these lectures would be a part uh, of our Issachar conference uh, as well and so uh, part of my motivation here is to, <laughs> is, is to get some stuff recorded for the conference. Uh, so uh, I entitled that talk, The Misuse and Abuse of the Bible. Uh, I suggested to them, as I will suggest to you, uh, three things that I want to cover uh, under that thematic thrust, and that is this. The Bible <clears throat> is dangerous. Number two, the Bible is divisive. And number three, the Bible is difficult. 
Now, I can already see you throwing those little ugly emojis uh, uh, on me here. So, so, so let me back it up, uh, press pause, hit rewind, and then hit play. When I say to you that the Bible is dangerous and the Bible is divisive and the Bible is difficult, hear me clearly. I do not mean that inherently the Bible is dangerous. Its danger comes from, listen, its misuse and its abuse. The Bible is divisive, not in and of itself, but rather the way we handle the Bible in terms of misusing uh, and abusing the Bible is what makes it divisive. It's, it's, it's difficult uh, given the fact that uh, the youngest part of the Bible, uh, uh, the New Testament, was written close to 2,000 years ago. Adding to that difficulty is the fact that it was written in three languages, none of which we speak today. It was written in the Hebrew language, it was written in the Greek language, and then uh, it was written in the Aramaic language, none of which we speak today. So, so, so the languages of the Bible are what we call in theology dead languages. <laughs> they, well, wait a minute, you, you just left Israel. Don't they speak Hebrew? Yeah, but it ain't Hebrew that the Bible was written in. Well, don't they speak Greek over there? Yeah, but it's not the Greek uh, that, uh, that the Bible is written in. Uh, those languages have, have changed over the years. And that's part of the difficulty. And I'll show you that uh, as uh, this series uh, unfold. It is written in a language uh, that we don't even speak today. Uh, it uses metaphors. Uh, it uses uh, locations. It, it, it uses things that were familiar to them in their culture that's not familiar to us in our culture. They had words that we don't have a word in our culture to translate from. That's what makes it difficult. We'll unfold uh, some of those things and concepts uh, for you uh, as, uh, uh, as we go along. And, and, and because it is so fresh uh, in my mind because of our trip, uh, you, 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 you read in Luke chapter 10 where a man leaves Jerusalem and he goes down to Jericho. Well, look, I preached that for years. Uh, but a few days ago, I had an opportunity to go up to Jerusalem and down to Jericho. And now uh, stuff opened up for you because there is something uh, in the topography of that land uh, that makes clear uh, what's going on in the text. Uh, first of all, you don't go down to Jerusalem. You, you, you go up to Jerusalem. Uh, that city is built upon a mountain. It is built upon a hill. And you go up to Jerusalem. In fact, when you read the book of Psalms, there are a group of songs starting at Psalms 121 uh, that are called Psalms of Ascent. These were songs that uh, the, the nation would sing Watch this, they were called songs of ascent. As they were walking up the mountain to Jerusalem, they were singing these songs. Uh, but then, in Luke 10, it's a story about uh, uh, that quote-unquote good Samaritan uh, who leaves Jerusalem and he goes down to Jericho. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense to me now, having gone to Jerusalem. And then this, watch this, this steep drop to Jericho. We'll show you pictures of this in a few weeks. 
uh, the lowest place on the earth is the city of Jericho. You cannot get any lower on the planet than when you go to Jericho. It is 1,300 feet below the level of the sea. There's a sea over there. You've heard me talk about it. You've read about it. It's called the Dead Sea. Had an opportunity uh, to, to step into waters. Now, while many of our uh, other travelers were swimming uh, in the Dead Sea, uh, no, 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 no. We'll tell you about that later. Uh, Brother C and I didn't swim, but we watched others float. In fact, you can't even swim in the Dead Sea. You can float. But you can't swim in it. You get in it and you just simply start floating. Uh, but I want you to watch this. The Dead Sea, remember Jericho is 1,300 feet below sea level. But the Dead Sea is 300 more feet lower. It is literally the lowest place on the earth. And now when you read uh, a man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho. That narrow winding path is a steep walk down. Okay, enough of that right now. I, I want you to watch this. And that's part of the difficulty uh, of the Bible, knowing the topography and the demography uh, of the land. I want you to watch this, friends. Uh, the danger in the Bible is because of its misuse and its abuse. I want you to write this word down. It's called bibliolatry. Let me explain. <clears throat> bibliolatry uh, is a term that comes from combining two Greek words together. The word for Bible Biblos, and the word for worship. In a Christian context, simply stated, bibliolatry is the worship of the Bible. C -c Come here, real close. Uh, let me walk real slow right through here. Unfortunately, in our attempts to reverence the Bible, that reverence for the Bible has turned into worship of the Bible. Mm, let me try it again. Because of our esteem, our reverence, a great respect for the Bible. We've gone too far. It has become a worship of the Bible. Well, what's wrong with that? You don't worship the Bible. You worship the God of the Bible. John 4, 24, the Bible says, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You don't worship the Bible. I didn't say you didn't reverence the Bible. I didn't say you don't respect the Bible. I didn't say you don't esteem the Bible. I said you ought not worship the Bible. Part of this come out of the Old Testament. Uh, when uh, uh, in the book of Exodus, God is giving uh, the nation of Israel, what we've come to call the Ten Commandments, uh, and one of those uh, commandments uh, is about taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the Hebrew people and then the, later the Jewish people uh, took that commandment to such an extreme measure about uh, not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain, that they got to a point in a place whenever the scribes were 
uh, copying uh, the word of God, when they were translating uh, the word of God, when they were writing uh, the oracles of God, uh, they came to so revere the name of God that when they came to God's name, which we translate into English, Jehovah, they thought that that name was so holy and so precious and was to be so esteemed and held in reverence whenever one of the scribes would come to the name Yahweh, translated into English as Jehovah, whatever pen uh, they were writing with, they would take that pen, put it down, put up, pick up a new pen, put it in the ink, write the name Yahweh that we translate Jehovah, and once they had written Jehovah or Yahweh with that pen, they would not use it anymore. Well, listen, that's, that's reverence. That's not what that commandment was intended to say. You see, that becomes a case where we start uh, reverencing, esteeming, going too far. Um, when I was a lad of a boy, um, I was watching a movie one Saturday night. I won't forget this. I wasn't even 10 years old. I was watching a movie with my mother. Uh, and uh, uh, in the movie, the house caught on fire. Uh, the family uh, in the house was able to escape. Uh, the house burned down. The family came back uh, to... Uh, view uh, the destruction, the devastation uh, uh, in the house. And I remember in the movie, uh, a little boy <laughs> walked over in the midst of all of the ashes, everything destroyed, everything burned up. Listen to me carefully. The only thing that did not burn up was a copy of the Bible. Ooh, you need to hear me right through here. I saw that movie. I looked at my mother with a gazing eye with jubilation and I said to mother, I said, mommy, the Bible does not burn. <laughs> That's exactly what my mother did to me that night. She smiled. Uh, she, she knew real early uh, that I wanted to be a preacher. And, and she was just uh, uh, so encouraging. She, she was smiling at me, but she didn't want me to get the wrong impression. She said... Uh, uh, and lovingly, she called me Rita Rip. She said, now, Rita Rip, uh, the Bible is a book. It has pages in it. Uh, most of our copies are, are leather uh, attached. Uh, uh, I, I got discouraged. I, I, I'm just kind of looking cross out at it, Mama, but I, did, I didn't know enough to... Uh, uh, to offer any kind of rejoinder, uh, I just knew a wide-eyed boy saw in a movie that the whole house burned, everything in the house burned, but the Bible did not burn. Well, listen, uh, I reverence the Bible. I esteem uh, the Bible. I preach the Bible. I believe the Bible. Uh, but the Bible is more 
than just print on a page. In fact, uh, the psalmist is clear when he says we ought to uh, hide the word of God in our hearts that we might not sin uh, against thee. So uh, we have such respect and such reverence and such esteem for the Bible that at times we take it too far. I had a college roommate. Uh, both of us were aspiring uh, Baptist preachers. Uh, we had uh, 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 that little old uh, uh, room uh, that both of us, uh, all we had in the room was, was just a bed and a shower, a uh, basin. Uh, we had to share a desk. We didn't even have our own desk. Uh, his name was Steve Jordan, my first roommate uh, in college. And I remember that uh, uh, whoever gets to the desk first uh, after the classes would put his books uh, on the desk. And so uh, I oftentimes would come in the room uh, and uh, uh, since his books were all ready uh, on the desk, I'd put my books on top of his and one of his books just happened to be the Bible. I remember the very first time I put my books on top of his books, and one of his books was the Bible. I mean, Steve Spaz, I, I, I actually thought he was joking. Uh, given the nature of his response, I said, man, you shouldn't have eaten all those beans uh, in the cafeteria this afternoon. Man, what's, what's going on with you? And he said to me, and he was just as sincere as he could be. Uh, he said, uh, Richard, you don't ever put another book on top of the Bible, and especially my Bible. Well, listen, conceptually, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree that no other book ought to have priority over the Bible, but that wasn't what he meant. What he meant literally was, you don't set your book or anybody else's book on top of the Bible because he reverenced, he esteemed. Well, friends, that's called uh, bibliolatry, where we esteem, we uh, reverence, we revere uh, the Bible to the point that we start worshiping the Bible. Um, you, you may want to write this one uh, uh, in the chat there. Uh, I don't have it on the screen for you. But John 5, 29, Jesus encountered this same attitude among some of the people uh, that he ministered to uh, in his time. In John 5, verse 29, Jesus said uh, to the Pharisees, listen to this, search the scriptures. That itself was insulting uh, to the Pharisees because if they're uh, were anybody who were familiar with their Bible, it was the Pharisees. The scribes uh, and the Pharisee, in order to be one, <laughs> you had to commit to memory the first five books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. These guys knew the Bible. They knew the scriptures. And yet Jesus says to them, listen to this, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. Okay, let me push pause, hit rewind, and hit play again. Jesus tell men who knew the scriptures, who had memorized the scriptures, who were familiar with the scriptures, Jesus says to them, search. That's my admonition to you. Search. Watch this. Because a lot of us read, but we have not learned how to search. You're talking about not just casual reading, but a diligent reading and study of the word of God. Jesus said, search the scriptures. 
Watch this. For in them, that is in the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. Mm -mm. Salvation is not in the scriptures. Salvation is in the Savior. Ooh, you missed it. Salvation is not in the script. Jesus said, you think you have eternal life by searching the scriptures. But he says, the scriptures testify of me. Oh, listen, you have to read the scriptures in order to know about the Savior. Please don't miss me here. Don't distort, contort, uh, distort what I'm saying here. I'm saying it's not the scriptures that saved us. It's the Savior that saves us, which is why Jesus said, you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. If you want to know about me, you search the scriptures. They lead you to me after a diligent search. And then the third thing I would suggest to you is uh, the way we reverence the Bible uh, is in our courtrooms. Uh, it still amazes me when I uh, look at court TV, when I uh, look at uh, what happens in the, the halls of Congress and uh, 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 the House uh, and the Senate and, um, uh, and uh, you know, you look at court TV and you get on the witness stand uh, and they make you uh, put your hand on the Bible, raise up the other hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and then go to line. I mean, they just, they lie straight through their teeth. But this is what they believe. Somehow, that practice got started because they believe that if you place your hand on the Bible, you tell the truth. Listen, I know folk who put a Bible under their arms uh, and, and crawl up a tree and tell a lie rather than stand on the ground and tell the truth. See, there's nothing inherent about this book that's going to make you uh, tell the truth. But, but in our courtrooms, even to this very day, we swear oaths by placing our hands uh, on, the, on the Bible. Now, generally, uh, this notion of bibliolatry uh, uh, is used as an attack. Uh, on those of us who hold to the uh, inerrancy, the infallibility, and the supremacy of Scripture. Uh, it is often a charge employed as an uh, uh, inflammatory and derogatory attack on believers who hold to, I'm going to throw the word at you tonight. I'm going to explain it to you in the weeks to come. Uh, sola Scriptura. Uh, and are a literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, I know that needs a whole lot of explanation <laughs> that I don't, I won't take the time to explain to you tonight because we're going to elucidate upon it uh, more uh, in, the, uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, but it is the notion that it is scripture and scripture alone that's sufficient. That, that's what sola scriptura means. Scripture and scripture alone. Now, uh, I believe that. I, I'm committed to that. Uh, there are places in academia where uh, I and others are laughed at uh, because of our view. Uh, of scripture uh, but uh, we'll uh, unpack that uh, in the weeks to come I want you to know what my commitment is um, your preacher is committed to the notion that the Bible is the inspired <laughs> and here's the word that causes so much uh, confusion, uh, inerrant and infallible word of God. 
hardly a Sunday go by here at Stonecrest Church that I don't get in this pulpit uh, and use this phrase with you. Uh, I am committed to the inspired, inerrant, and infallible uh, word of God. Now, I want you to know that's my commitment. That commitment within the last year has caused me to lose some friends. Uh, that commitment within the last year has caused me to lose some members. Uh, that commitment has caused me to lose relationships uh, throughout our great brotherhood. Uh, but friends and members and relationships, now please, I ain't trying to throw shade on anybody. I'm trying to let you know what my commitment is. And sometimes uh, you have to stand alone and all by yourself when friends and relationship and others are attacking you I want you to know your preacher is committed to the inspiration the inerrancy and the infallibility of the word of God now I'm going to explain all of that to you in the weeks to come but uh, but I want you to see something here. 2 Timothy 3, 14. Paul writes to his young son in the ministry of Timothy, and he has these instructive words to say to him. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look what he says to him. And that from a child thou hast known did you see it? The Holy Scriptures. If you're reading the English uh, ESV translation, the New American Standard Translation, the NIV translation, uh, they would translate Holy Scriptures as the sacred writings. I want you to watch this, friends. Paul tells Timothy, from a child thou hast known the sacred writings. You've known the Holy Scriptures. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Woo! Oh, my goodness. Look at all this preaching right through here. He says, uh, you've known this from a child. Mm. You have known the Holy Scriptures. He says, uh, let, let, let me back up here. Because, see, you and I are sitting here reading that, and you and I are thinking the Bible. Uh-uh. When he says the Holy Scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament Scriptures. Hey, you better hear me right through here. When, when, he, when he refers to as the sacred writing, see, at this juncture in human history and in the life of the church, they don't have New Testament Scripture. Uh, listen, they don't have the book of Acts yet. They, they, they don't have the epistles yet. In fact, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. He just got it. They don't have 27 New Testament books. So when he talks about you've known the Holy Scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament Scriptures. Problem with that for us is, in Churches of Christ, we don't give a great deal of time, no attention to the study of the Old Testament. We should. Hmm. <laughs> We should. Well, why should we? He says, number one, those scriptures are able to make the wise unto salvation. What? I, I thought you had to read the book of Acts. They had no book of Acts at the time of this writing. All they had were Old Testament scriptures. Come, come here. Uh, let me refresh your memory. Um, in Acts 8, you have the story of a uh, Ethiopian unit uh, who's in a chariot uh, riding in the desert reading Isaiah the prophet. Preacher by the name of Philip comes up to him, joins himself to the chariot, asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I? except some man should guide me. Read it carefully. Acts 8, the text says, 
Philip began at the same scripture. What scripture was that? Isaiah 53. That, that's what he was reading. He began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. In order to preach Jesus, you have to preach the gospel. And watch this. He so preached Jesus and the gospel that when you read the narrative, it says, and when they came to water, when they came to water, the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, you don't find baptism in Isaiah 53. Ooh. But you find the story of the gospel. How Jesus was led as a sheep to the slaughter. How he was died. And how he was raised again the third day. All of that's in Isaiah 53. Folk, that's gospel. That's gospel. And that gospel is what leads to salvation. So watch this. One of the purposes of the Holy Scripture is to give us wisdom regarding uh, salvation through faith uh, in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The open news stones. Ooh, that, I, I'm shouting because I know what I'm going to say. You are in anticipation of what I'm going to say. My shout is what I know I'm going to say and what this word means. I know you can't shout right now, but I want you to watch this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And watch this. Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, there's so much to unpack just in that passage. But my time won't let me do it uh, this night. Listen, come on back. Uh, and in our next lesson, we'll start right here uh, as we talk about uh, the reason for Scripture and the profitability uh, for Scripture. You can't teach stuff. You can't have a doctrine that's not predicated upon the Word of God. I'm going to show you, friends, that the reason I'm committed to sola scriptura, Scripture and scripture alone is because some of you want to use your feelings, your emotions, your life experiences, and your traditions. Well, Brother Barclay, uh, that's what the Bible said, but I believe. See, that's the problem right there. That's why I'm telling you what I am committed to. I am committed to the authority of scripture and scripture alone. And whenever scripture contradicts your feelings, your emotions, your traditions, your upbringing, your behavior, you don't set aside scripture because scripture will do three other things. It'll reprove you. It'll correct you, and then it will instruct you in the right way to go. On until next week, may the Lord of the harvest bless you, and may he bless you real good. <laughs>